What it do, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to the Day by Day podcast for your Day by Day broadcast. I am your host, Day Day, and today we got a special one for y'all. I'm joined by a man of many talents. I'm joined by a actor, musician, trap R&B singer to be more specific. Oh, yeah. Who's created hits such as Bad Bitch and many more. Uh, you saw him on the Millennial Tour with... Bow Wow, B2K, absolute fucking legends. Yeah. An athlete, apparently. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined by the one and only Nick Lavelle. What it do, bro? What up, doe? What up, doe? My guy, how are you? I'm vibing, I'm vibing. You know, appreciate you for having me. Of you course. Know, Thanks for Energy is everything. I appreciate that, man. Of course, we live in Charlotte. And we're going to get straight into it. Bet. I said trap R&B singer. That's 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 a label that you take with pride, right? You stand yeah. firmly on that hill. Uh-huh. First time I ever heard it. I'm pretty sure it's the first time many of the viewers and listeners heard it. Go ahead and break down that term and where it came from. So um, trap R&B for me is just bridging the gap between obviously doing trap, like music and R&B. Having, um, like when you're singing and when you're doing different stuff, I rap and sing. So trying to bridge the gap, bringing it together. You got these guys now that's doing the melodic rapping or mm-hmm. melodic singing where yeah. they're not actually singers, but it still sounds good as a melodic tone. I'm actually singing and rapping. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just something that we came up with, me and my team, over the years just to kind of like separate that category. You know what I mean? So did you also kind of do it maybe to kind of erase the stigma of R&B singers can't be rappers? Did you try to bridge that gap in a way? Um, not necessarily, only because I feel where we at in music now, everybody's doing it. Mm. All the rappers are singing. Yeah. And then um you have a lot of singers who can actually rap. Right. So it's like if you just when it comes to music, I think it's just putting out the best work. Right. Ultimately just uh making sure that you're getting the music, whatever it comes to like, you know what I mean? When I hear a beat or somebody send me a record, they want me to hop on. I go on the vibe of the record. Mm. If the record gives me the vibe to rap, I'll rap. If it gives me the vibe to sing, I'll sing. And if it gives me the vibe to do both, I'll do that. Right. And I think um, that's that's more so the lane that I want. Because I just want artists. It should be just artists. Like, be able to dominate. I mean, you have the Drakes, the Futures, the Babies, the Tory Lanes, the people that, that, do, that do both. And they find major success. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So... And it seems like before, maybe like you said, now so more than anything, it's like rappers are getting real melodic. They kind of have one foot in, one foot out the R&B door, right? Yeah. And it seems before, correct me if I'm wrong, but like before, maybe in the music industry, they tried to put some type of limitation on R&B singers who said they could rap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dope. I mean, I feel like that for sure because this is how a person look at it, right? And I always look at everything from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. If you start off as a singer and a label signs you, and then you make a hit record off singing. Mm -hmm. Label ain't trying to hear nobody rapping. Like, no, dude, listen, I understand you can rap, but we need to keep producing hits. Right. We got rappers on the roster. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we got them for the rap. If you want some rap, you can write a rap, and we'll have them rapping on your song. Mm -hmm. But you're going to focus on singing because the way that we envision, the way that we invested into you, we invested into your style, your look, your image, your whole... Like ensemble, and it's like we want you to push this. This is what your fans, they're not looking to see you rap. They're looking to hear you sing. Mm. And if this is what's selling, this is what putting people into them seats and them concerts and selling merch, this is what we want you to focus on. Now, once you get to a point in your career where you have a little bit more control, then you can kind of like dictate stuff. You mm. know what I mean? But I feel early on with rappers or singers, they're stigmatized towards being in a certain lane and staying in that lane until they work their way up and mm-hmm. then they're able to control their own narrative. So let's rewind when you were more so in the beginning stage and you kind of got hit with that limitation. Was that frustrating when you was like, damn, like y'all holding me back? Or was, was you like, all right, fuck it, I'm going to do what sells the tickets? So i am been very fortunate. I haven't signed to a major label. I created my own label, my own entertainment company That's what's up. over the years and I, yeah, I don't answer to anybody. So mm-hmm. I've been able to still put out different genres of music just to see what works. Because once you do get a hit record, 
now that's the record that people remember you for. So, like, how the consumer thinks, if you put out a dope rap record and you enter into the world and you're introduced to the industry and to a lot of these fans as a rapper, now we're looking for that next single. Mm. Is it going to be a rap record? Now, this is how it was back then. Now I feel like rappers and singers can come out and drop a rap record and then turn around and drop a singing record. Yeah. If that's what they do. Because if the music you put out is just overly, like, just good, mm -hmm. I just think the consumers just, they gravitate towards it. But they're still going to give you their preference because people all, that's what everybody, that's the whole world. We all have preference. You know what I mean? But in my situation, like, I've, I drop rap, I drop singing, drop rap, I drop singing, and just keep seeing. And I get people who like both. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, cool. Now, if I just was terrible on the rap side and people was like, nah, you shouldn't do rap, then I probably would have pulled out. If I was terrible on the singing side, I probably would have, you know, kind of limited myself. But your consumers typically decide what route and what lane you want to go in for the Absolutely. most part. At least that's what I've experienced over the years. So let me ask you, which one are you better at? I think I'm, um, if I got to be completely honest, I think, do. I think I'm a better rapper than I am a singer. Just because my voice isn't as strong as a real singer, mm -hmm. but it's still good. Mm -hmm. And it's like I make good songs, great songs. When I rap, though, I feel like I can do it so like effortlessly. Like, you feel I more, just, you feel more raw in that rap lane. Yeah, I do. I feel a little bit more alive. I feel like I can perform it better. But I, my performance when it comes to R and B is just as well, it's just as great as well because I'm, I'm able to, you know, to cater to the women and I'm able to literally like do my thing. But I feel like they both bring out two different sides of me, and I feel like they give two different perspectives, and it allows people to have a full plate when they're digesting me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just, it's dope, though, because, like, I love doing both. Like, I have records where I'm, I am singing on the hooks and rapping on the, on the verses, and then sometimes it's the other way around. It's just, it's just fun. I just love having fun with it. You know what I mean? I and think it that's what it is. And it seems like, I mean, like we've been talking about today more so than ever, that's what it is. Rappers usually sing on their hook. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got Drake, but look at NBA Youngboy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He sings on his hook. Uh, a Boogie, even though he more so sings than raps, but it's like that's the norm now where instead of, you know, finding an RB singer to fuck up the hook, like rappers will just go into the go into the booth, sing, put some effects on their voice, and then use that as the hook. Cost efficient. <laughs> mm. So you got to think from that perspective, it's like, I'm trying to save some money too. Right. I ain't trying to pay for no feature, but... yeah. A lot of times when these dudes are all, all under the same label, it is easier to go to, um, you know, get somebody on it. Because a lot of times the labels position it like that. Mm -hmm. If they know this rapper is about to drop this big record, and then if they if they get a song, because a lot of times what happens is, and I know a lot of the industry, industry stuff now because I'm in it, and I've seen it, and I've been in these label meetings, and I've been in these writer camps and these writer rooms, and I'm seeing how everything is being constructed. So when a record comes to the table, it's like, all right, cool. Who's rapping? Mm. Who's singing? All right, cool. We're going to give uh, King Combs this song. And then we're going to go get Chris Brown for the hook. All right? And, and that's just how it goes. And, and, and that's just what the... they like, it's going to be a big record. And, but we know Chris Brown hold his weight, but now we need to build King Combs up. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go get the big rap or big singers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So he can be on the song. And, boom, well, now we got it like that. You know what I mean? That's that's typically how that joint be. When if you ever see sometimes where where the, where the rappers having a singer on it and stuff like that. So you be in these meetings and whatnot, and you hold your own weight because, like you said, you're independent, right? Yeah. So what made you want to start out independent and stay independent? Because I'm I'm you know I'm willing to bet that plenty of deals have been offered to you, right? So what made you want to say, Nah, I'm good. I'm going to stay on my route. Um, it's been like it's like mixed reviews with it when you do like I've done so much now at this point independently now I pretty much have no choice I almost have no choice but I would say I'm more toward I'm more leaning towards the deal now because when you first coming up what I think is um, a reason a lot of people sign deals early on is financial situations mm -hmm. that's really what it is you, like, you, you're going into the hood and you're offering millions or even hundreds of thousand dollars, maybe even a couple thousand dollars to a dude or a female who's 
living in an inner city and um, probably not, I like, probably, you know, not, don't have this type of money. Right. Never seen this type of money. Right. And they're being, you know, intrigued. So they are compelled to sign these deals. And whether they're good deals or not, it's just they doing it because they need the money. They're, it's life changing. Mm -hmm. And the exposure. That's and the exposure. That's the main thing. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the biggest thing. Like, that's where I'm more so leaning towards the deals now because it's the exposure. I felt like I've done so much independently and I've created my own lane so much and done so much. It's like, now I do need the help because mm -hmm. I made the money on my own. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I've sustained, you know what I'm saying, financial, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, my finances have been pretty dope over the past couple of years and just elevating, just starting businesses and things like that. But it's like now, I'm not saying I don't need the money. It's more so now I'm not thirsty for the money. Right. So now I can take a deal that's just going to be major exposure. Mm -hmm. type thing. So. Like my man's Benny said, shout out to Benny Butcher. Last year was about branding. This year is about expanding. Right. You started off, you already got the foundation. Now we need to kind of spread the wings on that. That's yeah. all it is. That's what's up. Um, so ultimately, what made you want to choose, when you first started out in the game, what made you want to choose the R&B route? Um, I just love singing. Dude. I love the music. I just love, I love what R&B does. Um, and where I was from, being from Detroit, we didn't have a lane for R&B. You know, so I wanted to be the person to kind of open up that lane, open up that door, and um, kind of like, you know, be the first one to pop it off as far as for the new generation. Yeah, because I was already saying, y'all started out with we start, it. Yeah, hell yeah. Motown. Yeah, Motown. Yeah, 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 Cadillac, yeah. all that good all stuff. That, Detroit yeah. is notorious for like Man, when it first Man, Detroit started, got right? so much, so many hidden gems and just so much like contributions to like the culture is insane. We were just talking about this the other day with me and my colleagues. But it's just funny though. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to do, I wanted to do the R&B. I was always just singing. Like I, it was always hobby, mm -hmm. you know, just singing. And I used to put videos on Facebook and and Instagram and YouTube and I just was just letting loose just yeah. trying my best to you know get to where I wanted to go things of that nature mm -hmm. cool those were good answers and <laughs> an answer I was kind of expecting I'm not going to lie because you said earlier that it catered to the women yeah. that's not fun that comes with it right yeah but that's the, what was happening is and people don't understand R&B ain't just it ain't just R&B not catered to the women these mm -hmm. women are more prone to listen to hip hop than the R and B. Everyone loves R and B, but no one wants to listen to R and B loud. It's like we love it when the R and B joint come on on some dolo shit. Yeah, it's dolo. It's balance. It's, mm. it's and that's what it is. But we're so like overwhelmed with hip hop now. It's like mm -hmm. you're accustomed, like you're trained mentally. Yeah. Like, this is what I like. Like. Even women back then, you'll see women driving in a car, listen to R and B. Now they banging the hardest mm -hmm. rap songs out. Yeah. So it's it's definitely not literally just doing R and B to cater to women. It's really just doing music. What what music makes people like really really navigate towards you mm -hmm. or gravitate towards you? You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that's what's up. Um, so we brought up. Uh, you mentioned Detroit. We're gonna get to that in a second. Okay. We just finished the back to school event yesterday with the basketball game charity event. You were involved with many of those. Uh, you're coaching your son's football team, right? Uh huh. What led to you being such an advocate for giving back to the community, more specifically with uh, children and, and young kids and whatnot? Shoot, having all these damn kids, I got. How <laughs> I many you got? <laughs> <laughs> I have four. Well, I have four children. I have a stepchild. And okay. then I have a child on the way. Okay, starting lineup. Yeah, yeah, starting lineup with a reserve. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's more so like how I, how I look at how I view fatherhood mm -hmm. is different, ultimately in itself, because you know the kids gradually, you know, what I'm saying like came about over the years, and it's like I always wanted to be a better father than my father was, but my father was a good father. It's just mm -hmm. that. I want to be better. The goal is to improve and to elevate. Yeah. So I was like, okay, how can I be more involved? You know. And then the thing is, I'm getting involved more because of like my children and having to teach them. You know what I mean? Things and, and building network and just when you when you build and when you like like when you bleed into your community mm -hmm. and you invest into the community, they bleed back. They show love back. 
and it and, and it takes care of home. It takes care of everything else. It takes care of itself. And that's something that I'm really, really big on. It's like, I've done so much on my own with no help. I can only imagine if I had help. Mm. So it's like, damn, it don't, it's not going to cost me. And even if it does cost me, I ain't tripping. Word. I just want to make sure that we're getting this message out to these kids, yeah. to, these, to these families, because it's so crazy. I, I think like more than ever now, I reflect on my life. Like everything I went through as a kid, mm -hmm. even growing up, it's just like, damn. I could have did this. I could have did that. Mm -hmm. Okay, what can I do to change the narrative moving forward? Like, how can I prepare my children? You know what I mean? Just for, for future stuff. So, you know, I think those were some of the driving forces for me to want to be more involved in the community and things of that nature. That's what's up. And that's solid as shit. <laughs> and I love how you, because I was actually going to ask, did it come from you not having that support and realizing what it could have done? Or did you have the support and be like, I got to reciprocate this energy? But you said you kind of, you know, found out things on your own way. And you're like, damn, if I had that mentorship, if you yeah. would, then it would have been such a more straight, narrow path. Yeah. Right. And that's huge because that's, I'm, I'm the same way. Whenever I preach to someone younger than me, my younger siblings, my little cousins, nieces, nephews, whatever, I tell them, I'm like, listen, I'm 27 years old. You four, five, eight, 10, whatever, right? I'm telling you shit right now that I didn't find out till I was 21. You 10 years old. I'm trying to save you 10 years of mistake Ooh. happening yeah. so that you can be set right here. You got a leap in life already, right? You with a head start, yeah. right? So that's what it's all about. Yeah. No, that's exactly what, that's a dope vibe and dope concept to have. Mm -hmm. And when you put it like that, it's like, yeah, thing is what what if you really think about it it'd be it be killing me sometimes man when I like I ain't trying to get too deep but I, I think about stuff like this when I meet women when I used to date women or even I have friends and they like me I gotta take care of my moms and I'd be like dude it's scary because it's like what like, like you gotta think as life goes on like you uh, like if you're 20 or you know you're 27 mm -hmm. most time I say your parents is about 20 25 years older than you it's like your parents had 25 years you know what I mean? Just to get stuff together on their own. Then as you were growing into an adult, they had additional 20 some years. Mm -hmm. Like what's happening with our generation? Why aren't we teaching our culture about credit and how to establish themselves and how to balance and prioritize and invest in and financial literacy? Because mm -hmm. it, it's just like, it's like a broken cycle. Yeah. And it's almost like you could have saved, like my purpose of talking to my parents or, or, or doing the things with my children is to save years so they not um going through the same stuff like making sure all their credit is good so they don't have to go through the same issues i went through and then the issues that my mom had and my dad went through and it's just it's just crazy so i think that is very very like prevalent like just to be on point with trying to teach the new generation and mm -hmm. trying to save them that time and yeah. it's not like you're cheating it's more so like yo we're giving you an advantage literally you know what i mean and you have to take heed to this type of stuff and to kind of piggyback on that you said you kind of question like why aren't we teaching about the financial literacy the importance of credit what and whatnot um you say you didn't want to get deep but just for a second we don't get deep yeah let's do it my perceptive uh my my perspective on it is first and foremost Society is not made for us to, one, know that type of shit, and for two, for us to explain it or educate the youth on it. They don't teach that shit in the public school education system, probably public school, I mean, private school as well, right? Right, right, right. So we have to know that we, you know, as the ones who are going to influence and educate the younger crowd, we have to step out of the box just to do that. Because like you said, it's very rare. So you already in its own have to know that you're stepping out of the box just to break it down to them. Because it's, it's such a small percentage of people who are doing that. Majority of us, our parents ain't doing it, what, uh, haven't done it and whatnot. That's because their parents ain't do it to them. And growing up, they didn't receive that education and they didn't receive the education to spill on to the younger, uh, younger generation. Yeah, That's why you see like owners and whatnot, they be passing the businesses on to their children and grand grandchildren and whatnot because they know, you know what I'm saying? But they know that everyone else doesn't know. So you have to step out of your box in the first place even to do that, to break it down to the younger generations and whatnot. It's tough too, man. Because it's like, I got, it's adults, like man, 40s and 50 year olds who still don't know about credit. Yo. And it's like, okay, all right. Like they know about it as, in regards of like, they, they know that, they know what credit is. They know it exists. Yeah. yeah. But I, I hear people, oh man, I pay cash, man. I don't spend credit. And I, yeah. like some of the people I've met over my life, they, oh, my parents told me don't touch my credit. 
I'd be like, damn, this is the mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the stuff I teach, like, even my younger, like I said, younger cousins and um, some of my even younger friends, like, mm -hmm. yo, as you get to this age, you can change your life so much if you just start doing this. You got a good job. You are in college. You have no children. You got no felonies. Listen, you can really pipe up real quick. You know what I mean? Like, Seriously. And, and, and by, by the time you do get to my age, your purchasing power is so insane. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can go into these places. And, I, and I'm learning stuff, too. You know what I mean? I'm still learning stuff. And as much as even when I learn some stuff, I'm constantly passing knowledge on. Yeah. I'm not one of those withholding information. Yeah. Now, you know, I do have a um, like a credit, like strategic marketing and like financial literacy like program that I mm -hmm. that I sell or that I that I you know said push out for people that is trying to get themselves together on that side. And it's like um, even with that, I, I'm still teaching them. And, and even after they pay me, if there's any questions, even months and years down the line, I'm still mm -hmm. you know I'm still here. The saying is the game is to be sold, not to be told. Yeah. Yes, that is true. But at the same time, you're not supposed to keep all of that wisdom and knowledge and energy within yourself. The universe needs it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're businessmen. You're a businessman. Not a you're not a businessman. You're a businessman. So you yeah. gotta go ahead and you know what I'm saying do that. But at the same time, dish it out on the other end. So let me ask you. At the basketball event, your team was Team Howell. Well. Uh -huh. I see that it's kind of like a phrase of yours, right? Yeah, it's a brand. It's a brand. Uh -huh. What is Howell? Well? You, you, right, you got the shirt. Yeah. What is Howell well and what does it mean? Where did that come from? Um. Okay, so, you know, I always love to keep it real, keep it all the way up with do. everybody. So, being on tour, um, I, I'm just, just being on tour, that tour life, messing with multiple women, kicking it, vibing. And I ain't gonna lie, we jokingly, we, we sitting out, we out to eat, and, and I think we out to eat with some females in there explaining to us, like, damn, are y'all, do y'all think I ever settled down? Do y'all mm -hmm. ever think, like, what, what, like, what do y'all get out of just messing with multiple women? Or, like, things of that stuff. And I'm just like, shit, hey, we, we living, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Um, being unapologetic, mm -hmm. you know, um, living life in your truth. This is all the stuff that's coming to my mind, and I'm like, listen, I'm out here thugging it. If I ain't married by 35, Oh, well. And then I just laughed. I looked at my man. I was like, oh, well. Literally, just like that. It yeah. was just like uh, like on impulse. This is how it came about. Yeah. And then as I like um, as I grew, you know, I was like, damn, everything I use, I'll blame her well. Mm. But not in a negative way, but it was just more so like, if you do something, stand on it. Yeah. Be real about it. Yeah. It is what it is. You uh -huh. can't sit here and just be like killing yourself for a decision you made that you was comfortable making when you did do it. So live in your truth. And I think it evolved over the years when I became a brand and just made people understand that, oh, well, now means like being unapologetic, being like living in your truth, understanding that, hey, I'm doing this and I'm living with the decision I make and I'm not afraid to, to live in this moment. It is what it is. I'm not like, it's no regrets. You know what I mean? I like it. So... I like the message behind it, and I'm definitely going to use that. I'm going to credit you, too. Oh, yeah. I'm going to credit you, too. Some shorty get the rapping out the side of a neck. Da, da, da. Oh, well. Yeah. Shout out to Nick Lavelle. <laughs> Straight like that. Straight up. We mentioned earlier, Detroit. The D. Shout out to the D. <laughs> I love Detroit. I got fam from Detroit. Man, they cool as a fan. Yeah. Oh, Seriously. Yeah. So let's talk about Detroit. Um, how long, how many years did you spend in Detroit growing up, and what was that like? Um, I've been in Detroit my whole life. Like, I was born mm. in uh, Detroit. I mean, like, Hustle Hospital, which is now Detroit, receiving. Um, went to Detroit Public Schools all the way until I got to middle school. Um, and then I kind of started going to charter schools. It's just parents, start, as parents start to progress in their lives, they like, okay, they don't want your, you don't want your children going to, like, because yeah. you hear about you hear about these schools. It's like, I don't want my kid going to this mm -hmm. school. I know what type of time yeah. all the neighborhood kids. They kind of want to give you a better opportunity. It ain't nothing wrong with that. So, you know, switching it up a little bit. Um, shoot, just, yeah, like I said, I, I, I've been all over Detroit. I'm from the west side, to be exact, from West Moore okay. in an uh, evergreen area. So I grew up on Stout. So um, it's, I've been there, like I said, my whole life. You know what I mean? My parents, uh, I think when I was younger, see, uh, I think I live, see, my granddad, and my, a lot of my family's from Southwest. 
you know, uh, if you watch the movie or the show BMF, mm -hmm. a lot of the, the streets and some of the areas that they mentioned, a lot of my family grew up in them areas. Mm. So uh, my cousins, a lot of, you know what I mean, grew up in that area. So my mom, we moved a little bit deeper into the West Side once I turned like, uh, I think I was like five. And I've been there. I was there all the time. I was like 16. My mom and my stepdad got divorced. And then we moved to Dearborn. And it's so funny because where we moved to Dearborn, we moved to Dearborn Heights, which is like a suburb. Mm -hmm. But it's so crazy because the Detroit side that we lived on was a literally cross war. So literally like how we also, like how you look outside, like a major street, like you'd be on this side, this would be, I guess it's to be Detroit. And then as soon as you cross the street, you'll be in Dearborn Heights. And the way the police respond, just that, it's mm -hmm. just across the street. Across the street. If you call the police and they and, and the call is directed to Dearborn, uh -huh. oh, they there in five minutes. Yeah. Maybe less than that. Yeah. You call the police in Detroit, yeah. they not coming. We'll get there when we get there. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's literally across the street. Yeah. That's how insane it is. Because however the the depending on I, I don't know how the telephone service work or the routing. But that number, once you're in Dearborn Heights and that number gets routed to that, that Dearborn. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's, even though it's across the street, I think it's a zip code change. Yep, the zip code. Is the Deer Park, is that technically Detroit still or is that another city technically? No, it's still, no, it's still, it's, it's Detroit literally until it crossover. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then Detroit the, and then it goes straight to Dearborn. So, so then the zip code changes zip literally code. across Woo. the street. Yeah, once they pick that up, then they know it. I mean, it's similar to, you know, with Maryland and D.C. or Baltimore and Baltimore County. Like, they know where it's coming from. Yeah, that's just steep. I was yeah. like, damn. <laughs> yeah, they know. So, um, growing up in Detroit, did you have any, like, influences that were maybe inside of the city or outside of the city? Who were some of your influences growing up? Be honest with you, I didn't really have, like, I can't look at somebody like, oh, man, I want to be just like this dude when I get older. I never, I never did that. I, I had cousins and family members I just didn't want to be like. I mm. said, oh, I want to end up like this person. This dude, he 20... Ain't got shit going for herself. And always at my mom and dad's house, sleeping on the couch, or this guy doing this, or this lady always asking for shit. I was like, man, I do not want to be that motherfucker. I want, yeah. I got dreams, I got goals, I got aspirations. I want to go places. I just, I, I always want to travel. Um, and I've always been um, a person that took risks. Like I'm, I was, I've been a big, big risk taker. What, um, what, what's your, uh, when were you born? What's your sign? I'm an Aries man, born okay. uh, April 11th. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Right. 90s baby. Yeah. Early 90s, baby, too. You know, y'all a little youngins. We climbing up the ladder, ain't try. it? Try. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Detroit, though, overall, just growing up in Detroit, um, it's it's definitely like when you're young, you don't realize it, though. Because you're, you're, your mind hasn't fully developed and you're not seeing stuff from a perspective of as an adult. You're seeing it from a kid, a young kid, a, a young teen, a teenager and all that. So you're living in it. You're in the moment. So you don't, it, you don't really see what's going on, but it's a lot of stuff that happened. And as I get older, I think about like, yo, this was going on. Mm. That was happening. Mm. I seen fights, uh, shootings. Uh, when you're able to piece it together. Yes, yeah. it'd be like, damn, we really seen this shit. It's, yeah. it's, it's steep, but it's, it's Detroit, man. Detroit is one of them cities where you love to be from there because no matter what people say, the reputation of being from Detroit is so crazy. Like, people respect you. Like, the mm -hmm. respect Detroit gets mm -hmm. is insane because they know, like, that's a rough city, man. You you had to really get it out the mud. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us had to. And even if you didn't, it's okay. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just that, hey, everybody has different walks of life. And it's like, Detroit definitely, I feel like it definitely prepared me mentally for a lot of stuff that I've experienced even, you know, now. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up, man. Yeah, but Detroit overall is on right now. I will give y'all to that. As far as the music scene, Detroit is on for two reasons. One, I mean, so many artists artists have always come from Detroit. Like I said, we go back to Motown and Cadillac. It may have had a small gap, but so many rappers today, you got, I mean, of course, you got M and Royce, you got uh, 42, you got um, uh, Dej Loaf, you got... Um, What's dude name? Um, T Grizzly, Big T, Shy, yeah, yeah, Sada T, Baby. Exactly. So many artists, but not only that, a lot of people are biting Detroit sound. Yeah, I've been seeing that. I've been seeing that, um, especially. And now it's another thing though, because you gotta be very, very like strategic, or you gotta be very, very like monitor. Yeah, monitor this shit because Flint has a sound that's mm. being really, really picked up by mm -hmm. a lot of rappers. You know what I'm saying? And shout out to Flint because. 
Flint is doing their thing, you know mm. what I'm saying? And um, they got a sound, but it's different from Detroit. But I think a lot of the sound start originates from a Detroit cadence. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Flint, they took the Detroit sound and they revamped it and mm -hmm. made their own sound out of it, which is still dope. And that's their own sound is unique. And I've watched some, and I've seen some rappers, big time rappers kind of bite off their stuff. Yeah. And it's like, damn, but yeah. it's dope. I'll tell people this. At the end of the day, when somebody takes from you, it ultimately shows, like, that means you could create it. Mm -hmm. That means you, because the thing is, they couldn't create it. You right. did. So if you can create it, you can create something else. But also, it shows that you are talented. It shows that you do have, you're an innovator. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You, you, you can transcend things. So I don't always look at imitation as a uh, form of, like, negative. I'd be like, shit, nigga bite off me, nigga, that's good. They say it's the greatest form of flattery. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And I'm flattered, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's what's up. So, okay, boom. So we got this good enigma coming from Detroit. You know what I'm saying? People, we got the artists coming from Detroit. The flow is kind of getting bitten a little bit in a good way. Um, so you left Detroit. When did you leave Detroit and go to Atlanta? I left Detroit twice. So I moved, um, so I graduated from college in 2015. Shout out to Western Michigan. I moved literally, um, that summer to Atlanta, and I came to pursue the music career. This is my first time, and mm. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to go ahead and try to pursue it and all this good stuff. So I'll go down, and I'm kicking it with some dudes. I'm, I have no plan. I have no direction. I got like a couple thousand dollars, and anybody know, even back then, a couple thousand dollars wasn't going to hold you in right. Atlanta. Yeah. So I get down there, and I'm just, I'm just all over the place, dude. And I just wasn't mentally there, and, you know, I went back home in 2016, regroup, revamp. Um, I still had two kids at the time. So I was like, cool, I'm just working my way through it. Got my money right, um, and I got myself a little more established. That's another thing. You know, got myself a little more established, went through some bumps and bruises throughout, you know, throughout my way, and I finally built my stuff up, and I finally got a, I finally got a foundation, and I moved back mm. in 2019. And um, I've been there ever since. You know so, I mean? so why Atlanta overall? Atlanta for me was, um, it was, it was all about balance. It was whether, uh, and this is back then. This is three, four years ago when I moved. Cost of living in Atlanta was pretty good. Yeah, was. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you said. It's, listen, <laughs> was <laughs> with strong emphasis. Yeah, it was really good. And I remember uh, me and all my homies. We all moved from from Detroit together. And then uh, we moved into like, and rented out some houses in Atlanta. And um, I used to be really big into scamming, you know what I mean, when I was coming up. So it was good for me to to travel to cities to do scams. Mm. And it just was like, all right, cool. I rather, I had burnt out the whole Midwest. So I was like, I need new scenery. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get there and I was able to get to the bag a little bit better. And I was able to kind of like be close to the music as much and I could be in them doors, I can be in them studios, be at these events. Cause there's so much stuff that goes on in Atlanta. People don't know it's so much going on all the time. There's always an album release party. There's always a, a movie premiere. There's mm -hmm. always a pop-up shot. There's always a mixer or something. And yeah. there's so many people there, the major labels, the millionaires, the billionaires, everybody's in the same mix. So I was like, I'm not gonna get that out of Detroit. No disrespect, I just you're just not gonna get that yeah. out of Detroit. Yeah. So I had to make that change for my future. And, um, I just didn't want to be, I was tired of the cold. I hate the cold. So I'm like, cool, I'm in the A. Um, it's a new it's a new scenery. You know, the women in Atlanta is fucking beautiful. Georgia beaches. Man, I'm like, and the good thing about Atlanta is like the women ain't from Atlanta. You know, I'm mean, not yeah. saying that's a bad thing. It's just that you're getting all the women from all over the you're country. You're getting the best from different spots. Exactly. Yeah. And everybody's looking at the same, everybody here, we on that hustle vibe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to run to some women that, that's on they, on they shit. So. Mm -hmm. I was just ready just for that whole change. That's yeah. how I'm over Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Like we said before earlier, it's about expanding. Like no one stays in their city the, the entirety of their career and just blows. Like you got to go where it's at. I mean, shit, let's call it for what it is. Atlanta's known as like the black Hollywood yep, nowadays. Yep, yep. Like people are going there to really expand and network and kind of, you know what I'm saying, grow what and they got going on. people don't realize it's every, uh, listen, at least, I want to say at least 70, 80% of major artists has a house in Atlanta. Oh yeah. For sure. You hear it all the time. And and, and I see these guys. 
but you'll never know where they live, which is dope, which is good. You know, keep your shit to yourself. Because it's big. You got Atlanta, the city, and then you got like the county kind of, right? Yeah, you got all, yeah, because I live in Gwinnett County. Oh, so yeah. I live like 30 minutes yeah. from the city, but uh -huh. I like it. I'm out the way. Yeah. And I come to the city when I have a business. I own a hair salon. I own a, a couple businesses that's in the city. Mm. So if I have to pop through, you know, for anything, then I could just come to the city. But for the most part, where I stay, my children go to school, with the you know, best public school system in, you know, say in Georgia. So, or in the greater Atlanta area. So mm -hmm. it's like, I like to stay out way yeah. type shit. Yeah, that's what it is, man. Um, so speaking of where you're currently living at, current endeavors and whatnot, uh, recently you got engaged. Yeah. Congratulations on that first and foremost. Big congratulations on that. Was you nervous when that happened? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You, you never, you're never, like, you don't ever want to feel like, oh, I just know. You know what I mean? Yeah. You never, you never could be too sure. Right. You know what I mean? You pray on this stuff um, and... You, you, you ultimately prey on just making sure that you are making the right decision. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But what, what, what my whole vibe when it comes to engagements is, um, in marriages is, is deeper than the love aspect. You know, oh, yeah. I tell people all the time, I'm not gonna give you advice on relationships. I can't. I'm not that person because I'm right. not perfect, and I'm still not gonna be perfect. It's just the way my life is set up. That's just not me. Mm -hmm. But what I explain to people is find somebody that's the most compatible with you mm -hmm. and then structure y'all stuff together. Whatever y'all decide, people think that when you get in relationships, it's supposed to be like this. Yeah. No, it's not. It's what you want it to be, what right. you and your partner agree on. And I feel like the things that me and my partner agree on are things that benefit both of us. Mm. You know what I mean? And then we allow ourselves to have a voice and we, we negotiate on things that we, you know, that we want to talk about or whatever we feel, you know, we want to move forward on. And I feel like this person is the individual that's the most compatible for me. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's just how I kind of viewed it. And even with that, you're still nervous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're like, all right, I want it to work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't want to fail. Yeah. You know what I mean? I felt before. I felt relationships. I, I've been the person that single-handedly failed the relationship. Mm. So it's like, all right, cool. What can I do now to make sure this, re this relationship and this marriage is, you know, they prosper? Well, at least you can take accountability now, first and foremost. So that is a healthy step in the right direction to begin with. No, it's a fact. So what are you most looking forward to in this new journey that you're embarking on? Um, Just just getting closer. We, we've already got closer. How long have I known each other? How long have I dated, I should say? I, I like to tell both. I like that you asked that. Because mm -hmm. knowing somebody or knowing of somebody, right. you, know, um, you know, that matters. And then knowing the person. So quick story with her, known her since I moved to Atlanta. I was messing with a chick that worked at this club and I was in the club um, and, and it, it was just in our beginning stages. Like me and the girl was just cool. We wasn't even, I don't even think we were sexually active or anything. Right. But we just cool. Visiting her, catching a vibe. I seen my fiance now in the same club, but I, I didn't like approach her in a way of like on some intimate shit. I just was on some networking. I was new to Atlanta, mm -hmm. just networking. Hey, here's my Instagram, tap in with me. You know, I thought she was definitely a cute chick. But even in that time, she wasn't like the girl that I go for because I just, like, I was so stuck in this mindset of just like, oh, I need a badass Instagram yeah. model type yeah. chick that's always on the ground posting all that. That's, that was my vision for what I thought I needed. And don't it be like, it's always turn. It always turns out like that. Like the one that you really take personal and mess with on the long run is the one that you don't kind of see yourself messing with it in the in that current time. Yeah, yeah. Because you're stuck on the facade of the visual. Exactly. Yeah. And and the thing was that was something that was big for me because I was like, damn. I look at um a lot of things that that transpired over the like the first couple of years of me knowing her because we follow each other on social media and we always say stuff to each other. But it was never, like, I think I was more so, um, like, more pushy. Not pushy, but more so just, like, I was the aggressor. Like, mm -hmm. I was the one that went after her and mm -hmm. pursued her and, and make stuff. But she can see clearly the lifestyle that I had. You know, right. Multiple women, going through a little different shit, all this. And it was what it was. I was I was, I lived in my truth. I never shot away from it. I've always been a dude that's been transparent with women when it comes to dating and things of that nature. But with her, she, like... She had a dude, and I never knew that she had a dude, but she carried herself like she had a, she was in a relationship. Mm -hmm. She never was rude to me. Mm -hmm. She supported my music. She supported some of my events and um, posted, reposted stuff. And <clears throat> excuse me. 
and still didn't give me the time of the day, but didn't she, like didn't push me off. Right. It's not like she kept me on the side. She more so just was like, I respect what you do. I support what you do as mm -hmm. a friend, as a fan, yeah. as a consumer. Nothing else. Right. Uh, she ain't sending no hard eyes. But the only time she did it was when it was probably my kids. Mm. I used to be like, man, who, what the fuck? Like, what, who is? Like, girl, listen, I'm making a man. Like, you got me fucked up. <laughs> but I wasn't pursuing her, yeah. like, solely. So I didn't care. It's like, all right, you're one of a million chicks that I'm, like, talking shit to mm. here and there. But once she finally broke up with the dude, I was literally coming out of my little toxic situation with the girl that I was originally messing with when I first met her. And I felt like, I was like, man, I'm tired of going through this bullshit. You know what I'm saying? And she was going through a little toxic situation too, so she was tired. Yeah. And we finally went out on a couple of days and we, we kind of locked in. And it's like, ever since me and her locked in, we've been with each other, we've been messing with each other ever since then. Like whether we was on and off, whether we was fully committed, we was locked in. Yeah, like I've never missed a birthday for her. She's never missed my birthday. She's, uh, as far as since we've been dating, and it's been uh, two and a half years. Mm. You know what I mean? But I, like I said, I've known her for four years, mm -hmm. but dating for two years, two and a half. And then it's like, shit, hey. And now we're expecting a baby and getting married. Hey, it's, it's to me, shit, it's straight for me. Hey. You know what I mean? Shalom, brother. <laughs> Shalom. This is going to be your fifth or sixth child. It's going to be my fifth child. Fifth. My fifth child. Okay, that's She has up. a child from a previous relationship. Okay, so that's why we said the yep. early... Okay, uh -huh. add on. That's what's up, man. That's what's up, man. Um, Yeah, that's what's <laughs> up. <laughs> Beautiful beginnings, man. Look, everybody... Look, everybody... <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to be on this one. <laughs> um, so speaking of, you know what I'm saying, current endeavors and whatnot, uh, what else do you got going on and what's to come in the near future career-wise from you? Man, um... It's so much, though. It's, it's so crazy. Like, on the business side, I do own a hair salon that me and my fiance own together um, called Asaya Beauty Lounge in Atlanta with Stone Mountain. And then I own an event space. Make sure y'all pull up. Please do, goddamn. Come get slayed, ladies. So all-purpose salon. So, you know, they specialize in makeup, um, hair, nails, lashes, all that good shit. So, yeah, definitely tap in. Um, event space. Uh, got a food truck that I'm about to get ready to drop. Then um, I got a couple of personal endeavors like the credit company and a marketing company and a label and things like that. So I'm just working on building those things up because those are things that bring me in the income on, you know, the daily, mm -hmm. the monthly, the residuals and things like that. I do own several properties across the country. So I okay. am into real estate um, just on the investment side. So, you know, still building that up. And then just ultimately just finding little things that I can invest in that will bring me more money on the back end type shit. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, those are from the financial standpoint. From the music side and the acting side, I am currently filming a movie right now, a little short film. Well, no, I want to say short film, independent film Okay. right now. Um, so we've been, been working on that. Um, and I've been developing my children. You know, my daughter is a, a aspiring actress and a musician as well. And then, ahead, so now. I'm definitely trying to get her yeah. involved. And my son is playing sports and extracurricular activities. I'm a full-time father. So it's like balancing all this, mm -hmm. fatherhood, the music, the business, mm -hmm. all that. I'm also doing a reality TV show right now, showcasing and highlighting Black Fathers of Atlanta, mm. things like that. Just we showing, need that. Man, yeah, we don't have we nothing for us. We need that. So I said, yeah, I'm stepping. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So you got three full-time jobs. You got the, the financial side behind the scenes of the music with the investments and businesses going on and whatnot. You got the fatherhood side, bringing up your children, make sure you're doing that in the best way possible. And then, of course, you got the music career going on. Yeah. We got a busy man. Yeah. That's what it is, man. Well, listen, man, um, go ahead and let all the viewers and listeners of the Day by Day podcast know where they can find you at. All right, y'all already know. It's your boy, Nick Lavelle, a.k.a. Mr. Howell. You feel me? You can find me on all social media platforms at It's Nick Lavelle 1. Make sure y'all tap in, subscribe, you know what I mean? All those good stuff, you know what I mean? Make sure you subscribe to Bro Channel as well. You know what I'm saying? Turn the bell on. Yes, sir. You know, all that stuff means so much to us. And a lot of times we don't we don't emphasize and we don't put stress, we don't stress it enough that it costs you this amount to support somebody. Absolutely. All right? A repost, a reshare, mm -hmm. a retweet, anything, it costs this amount. All right? And y'all doing it for all these celebrities that y'all don't know. Yeah. 
And, and we all, baby bumps. Yeah, exactly. Saying congratulations. Yeah. And we can't even get a, a little support. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so that's that's just, that's what it is. Where I'm at with it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody for tuning in, whether you're listening on your respective podcast platform. Listen, this thing is on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you are bumping your podcast, day by day is there waiting for you. Shout out to all my viewers on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe, whichever platform you are on. That way you can be kept up to date. Shout out to Nick Lavelle for joining us today Thank live you from Charlotte. Oh, yeah. And we, and we got to give a shout out to the ambitious shawty. I see you over there, Sarah. Shout out to Sarah, aka the ambitious shawty, for oh, yeah. setting this up and being busy the whole weekend with the back to school event and whatnot. You're doing your thing, shawty. We see you. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that y'all stay safe, stay sane, but most importantly, stay blessed. Peace.